Welcome Dolphins fans, haters, and everyone in between to your favorite show discussing the greatest franchise in sports, the Miami Dolphins. This is the Fins Pod. My name is Moose, your host, and we have had an eventful past week in Dolphins land because not only was the NFL schedule dropped, which we're going to get into because it was pretty favorable, but the team made an exciting signing over the weekend as Pro Bowl vet Melvin Ingram has been brought into the building. So we're going to go through the entire 2022 Miami Dolphins schedule and talk about what the Melvin Ingram signing says about the mentality of this franchise. There is plenty to get into, so strap up. And let's dive in. Before we get into the Dolphins schedule, as well as our first win-loss projection of the offseason, we have to address the signing that was made by the Dolphins over the weekend. After having him in for a visit a few weeks back, Miami came to terms on a one-year deal with veteran pass rusher Melvin Ingram. And Ingram is not the same elite edge player that he once was but he's still a good to great player at times instead of that every down force that he was you got to use him more sparingly if you're a team that doesn't have much depth at the edge position that might not cut it right now for him because you're going to be asking this 33 year old who's coming off injuries to ball out at every level on all three downs That's the way he played at 28, but that's not happening now in his career. But he still has that veteran savvy, right? He's come back to health, relatively speaking, compared to what he was, you know, before the injury. But Ingram can still give a team high-level play in that rotational role. He's likely going to get 10 to 15 snaps a game, right? Coming in on key third downs in case of injury to another player or in a specific package based on a matchup against an opposing quarterback. Think about it, though. The defensive end, the outside linebacker room, it has a lot of depth now. You got Emmanuel Ogba, Jalen Phillips, Andrew Van Ginkle, and Melvin Ingram. Not to mention the likes of Brennan Scarlett, you drafted Cameron Good, and even like a Channing Tindall or Jerome Baker, who's going to be used in certain looks on the outside. Considering the Dolphins' depth now, the fact that Chris Greer is bringing in a guy like Melvin Ingram, it isn't for shits and gigs. It's because he expects the Dolphins to win now. And look, in big games against big-time quarterbacks, there are moments that you need those experienced, high-level players, players like a Melvin Ingram, if you don't ask him to do too much. You only use him in those moments. And this team, it's looking to make waves, and I love that mindset. And I think this signing points to that. Because look, Melvin Ingram is at a point in his career where he doesn't want to go through the rigors of an NFL season without the chance of winning, just doing it for the paycheck. He can do it for the paycheck and also try to win. And the fact that he looks at this Dolphins team and thinks, look, it could lead to victory, it means that the perception of what the Dolphins are is changing. Tyreek Hill coming in, Teron Armstead coming in. The team looks like a more competent organization. I mean, relatively speaking to what they were. And that's allowing them to make moves like this. Bring in an experienced player who still has something left in the tank and is trying to win. So I'm excited to see how Melvin fits in with this defense in that rotational role. All right, moving forward, we're going to get into the Dolphins' 2022 NFL schedule. And I will, just for fun, do that tentative win-loss projection as we go through it. But look, as you find out each and every season, no one knows how things are going to shake out in in an NFL regular season because the teams that you project to suck usually explode onto the scene. Just look at the Bengals last season. I mean, look, we're talking about our Dolphins like we're coming in hot. Other podcasters for other, you know, team fans and their own specific podcasts, they're probably like, yeah, the the Dolphins are a win when they look at the schedule. They don't see us coming. So we have no idea how things are going to shake out. You know, the Bengals last year go to the Super Bowl and no one even thought they were going to be that competitive. You know, teams like Baltimore Baltimore or Cleveland, teams you thought might be contenders, didn't make the playoffs. But look, still, assuming a few things, you can still gauge where we think our team's going to be this season. Firstly, if we look at the Dolphins' defense, having brought back all those starters, 
plus, you hope for the development of key young players like Raquan Davis, Jalen Phillips, Jalen Jalen Phillips, Jalen Phillips, and Javon Holland, right? Mixed in with returning vets that you got, Xavier Howard re-signed, Byron Jones, Baker, Christian Wilkins, right? He's developed. The output of your defense should be similar. Not to mention the team running it back with the coaching staff, Josh Boyer hopefully leading the charge for this third consecutive season. So you know the identity and overall play style of the defense should remain the same. At least you hope so. Because the last thing we want to see is that similar start in 2022 as we had in 2021, where for some godforsaken reason, the defense played in base looks, allowing offenses to kind of get comfortable get in rhythm, not playing to this defense's strengths, which is attacking on all fronts, which they did in the second half of the year. So if Miami continues to play in that style, the style we know that works, aggressive, blitz heavy, then you should see a top 10 unit, one that complements winning football and will help this team win. Not, not to, again, to mention the recent additions of Melvin Ingram and even Channing Tindall, right? The boys on the defense should be ready to go offensively is where the mystery remains for this team and that's where we can honestly only project and speculate but from what we can gather from Mike McDaniel's history he likes to run the ball and play an aggressive style of football that means rely heavily on the offensive line to get push utilize a bullpen of running backs who can continually attack defenses then take advantages of mismatch on the outside rely on speed and hopefully an accurate to a tongue of Iloa at quarterback. Cause this is the type of offense, at least from my understanding that Mike McDaniel would want to run right. First and 10 run the ball, get six yards, second down run again, get three. Now you're at third and one. Okay. Run it again. Cause you know, you can get one yard. You get first four yards, say, and a first down. Now, second set of downs, the defense kind of on their heels. You've been running it down their throat. So it's first and 10. Tua, take the snap, play action, throw, you know, the defense is frozen. Uh, you throw a quick pass, second and short. Now, in this position, with an offense that has proven that they're running the ball at will, they can throw the ball quick, you have no idea what's coming, defenses play scared. It's second and short. You just illustrated, right, that you'll run the ball. You know you can get a first down that way, and you're confident that if you want to throw the ball too, you can do that. It's a very powerful thing and something Tua and this offense has not had. We're very predictable based on the down and distance. At least that's what it was over the last couple years, and that's what you hope changes. You hope that the ability to kind of act at will, hey, now we want to move the ball running. Now we want to move it with quick dump offs. We're going to use play action passes, screens, you know, way more options as an offense because you have a creative mind behind it. Something that was not there again for the last few years, honestly, going back a decade. But equally on the outside, you got Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle to complement this run game. And again, so you can't commit to one thing or the other as a defense, because if you do, then the other thing Miami has could expose you. And that's if. Mike McDaniel isn't full of it, right? If he understands what his offensive identity is and he communicates that in this offseason program and builds a team that's smart, knows actually how to execute his vision, then if he's able to do it, we're cooking with gas because, again, the roster across the board is improved and you expect an improved Tua. So, hey, that's what we're going to look at as we go forward because I don't think it's a crazy assumption that this team does take that significant of a step up so here we go going through the schedule thinking of that team now look if you think the Dolphins are going to be way worse you're probably not going to agree with my projection if you think the Dolphins are going to be better then hell you might think I'm underselling them but based on what we just said this team should look like this is what I think the season's going to be so week one home opener against the New England Patriots win I think this is a win for multiple reasons. First, look, the Dolphins are going to come out with much more energy. It's going to be hot in September, and New England is going to get worn down. Seen it before, going to see it again. I think the Dolphins are going to run the ball, and that's going to control time of possession, allow our defense to attack Mac Jones. And Miami swept the Patriots last season. Tua is 3-0 and against Belichick in his career, so why would I say the Dolphins would lose this one? So if you go a little deeper, you'll also see that Miami shouldn't just win this game. They should win it with ease. 
While the Dolphins have added playmakers all over the board, retaining talent, right, ensuring that this young coach gets a good deck to start his career, the Patriots have gotten weaker. The only chance of New England competing for a playoff spot is if Mac Jones is like the truth and has a major step forward. Because if you look at that roster, they shouldn't be nearly as good as they were last season. Because unless Mac Jones is like an elite quarterback, and look, as good as I think he is, I think he's solid, I don't think he's elite. Because this defense lost linebackers, right? Dante Hightower is gone. Even though he was kind of on the way out, he was a veteran leader. He's gone for them. Even a guy like Van, Van Noy, as much as he's kind of mediocre, he's gone. They didn't get anyone to replace him. And again, they lost J.C. Jackson. And the defense is coached by Steve Belichick, and it collapsed in the end of last season and hasn't gotten any upgrades. And offensively, you replace a good lineman like Shaq Mason with Cole Strange, and then you lose Ted Karras, who isn't a great lineman but a starter, to the Bengals. So again, their major offensive upgrade, the Patriots, if you ask like a Pats fan, hey, uh, how's your offseason look? You know what they'll say? Well, we say Tyreek Hill, Tron Armstead, oh, Mike McDaniel, this new offense, Chase Edmonds. You know what? Devontae Parker. That's their guy. That's their guy. And, oh, also an overdrafted speedy receiver who honestly kind of looks like a high schooler on the field. So Miami should win this game and start the season right. Week two, Miami faces the Baltimore Ravens in Baltimore. This is a tough one. Look, Miami did manhandle them on national television just this past season, but I think our personnel matches up against them better than most NFL teams, but They're healthier than they were last year. They had a lot of injuries when we faced them, and they're going to know that we're coming. Because when you punch a team in the face as hard as we did, embarrass them on national TV, you can expect a a little bit of a fight back. And that's why, as much as I hope for a win and think the Dolphins would be capable of a repeat performance, my deference is going to go to the former MVP and Lamar Jackson. So I'm going to give us a loss here. Then Miami returns home to play the Buffalo Bills, and this one hurts me. I think the measuring stick, right, for our team is the Buffalo Bills. Hate to say that, but they're the AFC favorite, so of course our division, we got to realize that that's the bar that we're going to. So if Miami wants to get where we want to be, you got to beat Buffalo. We have that defining game in the first month of the season. Thank you, NFL schedule makers, not. But for the same reason, I don't think or I do think we're sweeping New England, I don't think we're going to win this game. I'm not, I can't boldly say that. we got to prove it first. The Bills have dominated the matchup for the last few years, so you hope Mike McDaniel comes in here and spices things up. You hope that those additions, the Chase Edmond, Tyreek Hill, and the improved defense contains Buffalo, but you need the Dolphins to prove that first. They've let us down in that department too many times. So the Dolphins are now 1-2. and two. Not great. Even worse, when you look up, look up and see the defending AFC champions, the Bengals. On national TV, Thursday night football, barely national, but Thursday night football at Cincinnati. I'm going to predict a Dolphins win. We match up well against them compared to other teams. Look, we got the corners and safeties to cover the, that arsenal they got of pass catchers. And we have the ability to put pressure on Joe Burrow, which is, again, how you kind of contain and stop Joe Burrow, as you saw in the Super Bowl. Offensively, too, we have more talent than they do defensively. I think our defense is closer to that, their offense than their defense would be, hypothetically, if our offense is as good as we hope them to be, because the Bengals, that would be their weakness. Weakness. So it's going to be a big game, Tua versus Burrow, which, again, is another reason I think we would win. Because for all you want to say or what you think about Tua, the one trait that I think and I've liked about him is he seems to play well in the big lights, right? Yeah, he's had bad games in pressure moments, right? Rookie, Buffalo, (laughs) horrible game. Last season in Tennessee. But those were more, I think, bad weather games because they were kind of in normal 1 o'clock time slots. There are other reasons for those struggles, mainly the weather. But generally, going back to college, When all eyes are on him, it's kind of like a big primetime game. He tends to play well coming in in Baltimore against the Saints, throwing some big throws. So in a nationally televised matchup against his college nemesis, Joe Burrow, I think two is going to come to play. So I expect Miami to win this game. The, The team now goes and faces the Jets. Even though the Jets have improved, 
I need to see it to believe it. Going from like a four win team to like a six or seven win team isn't a major upgrade. So win. The Dolphins are now three and two. Things are looking better. Miami then plays kind of a fun one once every four years kind of matchup against the Minnesota Vikings. This is a home game, one o'clock. So for that reason, it's going to be a hot Miami game. I think Miami is the more talented team. I give the Dolphins a win. Next up, Miami stays at home to play Brian Flores, Minka Fitzpatrick, and the Pittsburgh Steelers on Sunday night football. Dub. Easy dub. Not only are the Steelers like in rebuilding mode, but there is a good chance that we're facing like Kenny Pickett. And if that's the case, our defense is going to feast on him. Two is going to ball out against the man who thought he couldn't do it. So Miami's sitting now pretty at five and two, one of the top teams in the conference, and the narrative begins to turn. Things get even better for us here because we get to go on the road to face the Detroit Lions. You can never predict these things, but that disclaimer was already said. We already know that the season's going to be random and no one knows the outcome. But the, the Lions, this is another Dolphins win. So it looks like we're streaking once again and the sun is shining. Six and two. If this is how the season goes, or if it's kind of close to this, it could be a special one. Honestly, a fun ride. The Dolphins then continue to play the gift that is the NFC East because they travel up north to face Justin Fields and the Chicago Bears. I hope they're a better team because I like Fields. It'll be a more exciting matchup, but I just hope that that lack of talent, I mean, for God's sakes, they re-signed Jakeem Grant. So again, I hope that shows through the lack of talent and Miami plays like the better team, which they are. Right, That risk factor is if Fields is like playing out of his mind his second year, has that sophomore explosion, which is a possibility. He's a high-ceiling kind of guy. Or, again, if Tua hasn't proven to get over his bad weather play, which, again, to be honest, has not been good enough. So you hope that gets better, but he could struggle in the chilly Chicago air in a November game. Still, though, the Dolphins should win this game, 7-2. and two. Now, this next game, is special. It's a home game against Deshaun Watson and the Cleveland Browns. I hate Watson. I hate him for what he's accused of doing. I know if he's proven innocent, separate convo, but don't like him. Hate that he was linked to our team for as long as he was. It's like a parasite. I want nothing more than for Tua to outperform him and honestly shut every dumbass, a dumbass hater up. But I also know Watson is a superstar. He is. Sometimes he can play out of his mind. Assuming he's suspended week 10, the week of this game, it's likely going to be one of his first games back, and he's going to be motivated. He's going to be fresh. It's still going to be early in the year for him. So physically, he's going to be ready to go, and Miami's going to be due for kind of a letdown, considering all the winning that I'm having them do. So I'm predicting a loss here. It's going to be a tough one. It's going to be one that we want, but for that reason, we're not going to get it. Loss. Miami falls to 7-3. and three. The Dolphins then get a decent bye in week 11 before getting a cupcake off the bye, playing at home against the Houston Texans. This is a win. Don't need to get into why. The Dolphins then travel up to San Fran, play McDaniel's old team, the 49ers. As fun of, as fun of a game as I think this is going to be, high scoring probably, competitive, I think Kyle Shanahan pulls the win over his protege, right? The master will show to be the master, and his game plan will likely outduel the young Padawan. It would be a great story if McDaniel's able to win in his first head-to-head face-off against the guy who helped to build his career, but for the sake of this exercise, we're going to give the Dolphins another loss. The team then faces the L.A. Chargers. I know that the Chargers have gotten better, but I just think Tua plays really well Again, for obvious reasons, he did the last time these two faced off, and I think that they've gotten better, both teams, in their own respects. It's going to be competitive, but I just think Tua is the more clutch guy. Again, this whole Tua versus Herbert thing, yes, Herbert has the leg up, but in terms of whose career is going to prove to be better, hey, that's still up for debate, and that's what's going to be the difference in this game. For right now, head-to-head, both good offenses, solid defenses. It's just about which quarterback has the bigger balls. I mean, I saw it when they played as rookies. I expect to see it again. I think the Dolphins are going to be 9-4 and four heading into the final stretch, and that's like the best place that we would be as a franchise like in a long time. 9-4 and four would feel great. Then comes the onslaught because the team travels up to Buffalo. 
I'm giving us another L. But in this moment, right, if hypothetically it goes this way, the Dolphins are like 8-5 and five or 9-4 and four heading into this situation, and they've had a good season. A win against the Bills at this point would be huge. It would be a statement game to both the Bills and the league that Miami should be considered one of those teams, right? A team that is capable of getting out of the AFC. It's a long shot that we would get there. We got to prove it, win these games first, but it would be one hell of a story. Despite that, Miami's going to lose in the simulation and fall to nine and five. Miami then comes home to play Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. If this game was in Lambeau Field, I think it would be a loss. But it's one of those rare games where Green Bay comes to Miami in late December. It's a Christmas Day game. Merry Christmas. I'm going to enjoy that game. So because of that, it's in Miami on Christmas. And because I think our defense can make Aaron's life pretty miserable. They don't have the best weapons these days. He doesn't have Devontae Adams. So if Miami can put pressure on Rodgers, score on their defense in Miami in December, the Dolphins can win this game. 10-5. and Then Miami closes out the season playing in New England and then closing at home against the Jets. Guys, I'm going there. I really am. I think the Dolphins, once again, sweep the Patriots and sweep the Jets. They finish the season 12-5. and Easily good enough to make the playoffs as a wild card or potentially as the division winner. The schedule as a whole is honestly pretty favorable. There are projected spots which could be relatively easy, right? Teams like the Vikings, Lions, Bears, getting the Jets twice, the Texans. It makes those challenging games that you got against the Bengals, Chargers, the Browns all the more important. And if the Dolphins elevate their program on all levels or hell, if the offense improves greatly and say the defense just takes a minor step back, but Tua and Tyreek and Waddle are balling, the run game is there, and the defense is, you know, top 15 That would allow for the team to put points on the board at a high rate and win football games. 12-5 and right now, just being Dolphins fans, sounds crazy. But when you consider what this roster has become and what they've built to over these last two seasons even, combined with this offseason, and whether or not Brian Flores was the reason for those successes of these last two seasons, or if he was the guy holding the team back and the offense, we're going to find out. It's on the shoulders of Mike McDaniel to put a good offensive game plan in each and every week. It's on Tua to improve his game and become the quarterback and player that we know him to be capable of being. And of course, it's on Boyer and overall the defense, the roster as a whole on that side of the ball to keep being one of those exciting units, one of the most dominant forces in the league because you're allowing them to get that consistency, get that continuity. We're bringing back a lot of the veterans. So it's like, guys, you're here together. Just keep building on what you've made. So if that's the case, this should be an aggressive, blitz-happy, turnover-producing unit, right? Led by some elite players. The Xavier Howard, you got paid, ball out. Byron Jones, ball out. Javon Holland continuing to develop. So if it all comes together, I don't think 12-5 and is out of the question. We still have a lot of time to finish out this team, see if we add any more pieces, what happens if there's any injuries, God forbid. And again, starting this season in earnest when we play football games is when we're going to know. But regardless, it's sure a fun time to be a Finns fan. And I know we've won a lot of off seasons, and then the season is disappointing. But there's something different about adding a Tyreek Hill and, and getting a whole new co- uh, you know head coach who's clearly come off the tree of what's winning in the modern football, you know, and having a team pick a quarterback over a coach, it's kind of unprecedented when you look at it in recent history. So it's uniqueness and the ability to potentially be a great thing because you add great pieces. It's exciting right now to be a Miami Dolphins fan. Do you agree with the 12-5 and five finish, or do you doubt the outcome? What's your record prediction for the 2022 Miami Dolphins, right? Is this team going to underachieve because it's the first year of Mike McDaniel? You don't think Tua is going to improve? We're going to sort of underachieve as a whole? Let us know in the comments below. Robert, does Tua have the ability to excel at throwing the deep ball? 
Laura, yeah, Tua does have the ability to throw the deep ball, and people have to understand that it's very hard to drop back in the pocket and throw anything down the field when you have the 32nd ranked pass block unit in yep. front of you like he did last season. So, of course, he's going to throw those short passes. But now, with Mike McDaniel coming in, adding Teron Armstead and Connor Williams at offensive line, I feel like Tua's going to have a chance to breathe in the pocket and push the ball down the field to Tyreek Hill, Cedric Wilson, and also Jalen Waddle. So when I look at Tua, you got to understand that when he came out of college, everybody fell in love with him, and part of the reason was because of his ability to push the ball down the field. Between 2018 and 2020, he completed 54.4% of his passes 25 yards down the field. That's more than anybody in college football history in the last 10 years. So Tua's ability to throw the ball down the field is only connected to the protection that he gets and the guys he has the ball to throw to. Tua is a, is a faith-based guy, and now God's blessed him with all the weapons he can possibly <laughs> imagine on offense. All he has to do is go out and complete them, right? Tua is under more pressure, right? Tua is under more pressure this season than a lawyer who knows that his client is guilty in the courtroom. Ooh. That's going to do it for us here today. Thank you guys so much for listening to the Fins Pod. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Timothy Ritchie, Brian Googer, Chris, and Commander Pig, members of the pod and supporters of the show over on Patreon. Check that out. Links in the description or head to patreon.com slash finspod. Thank you all so much for the continued support. And please remember to like the video if you enjoyed the show. Subscribe just so you never miss a chance to chat about your Miami Dolphins. Remember that the show is available on all platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and of course, YouTube. Continue the conversation with us over on Twitter and Instagram at FinsPod. I hope you all have an amazing day. Until next time, stay safe. Heat in five. The Heat are beating the Celtics. Fuck Boston. Love y'all. Love y'all.